If you're new to our church, do fill up your welcome card so that you can redeem your free gift. If you've parked in Bangunanyin, don't forget to validate your Touch and Go card. One of the DNAs of SIBKL is to be a generous church. It is now so much easier for you to give. You can give via online banking transfer or do it now transfer. All you need to do is to scan this QR code and it will lead you to our giving page. You can also drop your tithe and offerings in the box just outside the sanctuary. It is because of your generous giving that we can be a blessing to others. Do you have some pre-loved items to give away? You can donate to Bless Ministry Collection Point at SMCC. You heard that right. Not Bangunan Yin, but at SMCC. Head up to the car park to level 1A and drop off your donation to share your blessings. Scan this QR code for more information.
there's no one else like you, Jesus. None compares to you, Lord. If you're new to our church, do fill up your welcome card so that you can redeem your free gift. If you've parked in Bangunanyin, don't forget to validate your Touch and Go card. One of the DNAs of SIBKL is to be a generous church. It is now so much easier for you to give. You can give via online banking transfer or do it now transfer. All you need to do is to scan this QR code and it will lead you to our giving page. You can also drop your tithe and offerings in the box just outside the sanctuary. It is because of your generous giving that we can be a blessing to others. Do you have some pre-loved items to give away? You can donate to Bless Ministry Collection Point at SMCC. You heard that right. Not Bangunan Yin, but at SMCC. Head up to the car park to level 1A and drop off your donation to share your blessings. Scan this QR code for more information. Your love has invaded my heart, consumed me and made me new. How could I live but to live for you? Ooh, ooh. I'm leaving my past behind. Freedom in Christ is mine. Won't live for me, I only live for you. If you're new to our church, do fill up your welcome card so that you can redeem your free gift. If you've parked in Bangunanyin, don't forget to validate your Touch and Go card. One of the DNAs of SIBKL is to be a generous church. It is now so much easier for you to give. You can give via online banking transfer or do it now transfer. All you need to do is to scan this QR code and it will lead you to our giving page. You can also drop your tithe and offerings in the box just outside the sanctuary. It is because of your generous giving that we can be a blessing to others. Do you have some pre-loved items to give away? You can donate to Bless Ministry Collection Point at SMCC. You heard that right. Not Bangunan Yin, but at SMCC. Head up to the car park to level 1A and drop off your donation to share your blessings. Scan this QR code for more information.
If you're new to our church, do fill up your welcome card so that you can redeem your free gift. If you've parked in Bangunanyin, don't forget to validate your Touch and Go card. One of the DNAs of SIBKL is to be a generous church. It is now so much easier for you to give. You can give via online banking transfer or do it now transfer. All you need to do is to scan this QR code and it will lead you to our giving page. You can also drop your tithe and offerings in the box just outside the sanctuary. It is because of your generous giving that we can be a blessing to others. Do you have some pre-love items to give away? You can donate to Bless Ministry Collection Point at SMCC. You heard that right. Not Bangunan Yin, but at SMCC. Head up to the car park to level 1A and drop off your donation to share your blessings. Scan this QR code for more information. You know, coming to the church early, pre-service, it is it's good that we can prepare our hearts to just quiet down and then be, be ready to worship the Lord. You know, those of you who are in online, um, just come and join us. Come and join us uh, in this pre-service. And the diff- there's a lot of different here, you know. You know, for, for us here, can you sense the presence of God in this place as we adore Him, as we prepare our hearts and connect with Him? Amen. Please be seated. 
Hallelujah. We want to welcome all of you in our midst. If there's anyone that's first time here, can you just wave your hands to me? Anyone that is first time? Oh, where? Anyway, oh, right here, right in the front, there's a couple. Bless you. And anyone at the gallery, praise the Lord. Well, after the service, please join us at the in a counter there and get a gift and also join us at the fourth floor in the hospitality for a cup of tea and some of our leaders were there you know to engage with you and connect some of the questions that you may have amen and those of you who are online you know you can let us know that uh, in the link that you are new and also we want to connect with you so just go to the link and say i'm new okay praise the lord Now, just before we go into worship, I will pass this time back right now into the screen. And let us look at the screen for this uh, week updates. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is it a separate experience from conversion? What is its purpose? Find out the answers to these questions and more in our upcoming session with Senior Pastor Chu. For further information, refer to the details on the screen. Narrow Street will be hosting their All or Nothing Camp. There will be exciting games, new people to meet, and a life-changing encounter with God. Register via the link on the screen. One of the DNAs of SIBKL is to be a generous church. It is now so much easier for you to give. You can give via online banking transfer or do it now transfer. All you need to do is to scan this QR code and it will lead you to our giving page. You can also drop your tithe and offerings in the box just outside the sanctuary. It is because of your generous giving that we can be a blessing to others. If you're new to our church, do fill up your welcome card so that you can redeem your free gift. If you've parked in Bangunan Yin, don't forget to validate your touch and go card.
thank you for your presence. We want to thank you for working in this nation, even when we don't see it. Oh God, we want more of your presence in this place. As your church, Lord, we want to intercede. We want to pray for this land. Jesus, we want more of you, Jesus.
God, indeed you are working. Even when we can't see you, you are working. Come on, let's just speak faith. You know the Bible says that where the Spirit of the God is, there is freedom. Amen. Come on, church. I want to invite you to continue to speak life, love into this land. Jesus, we enthrone you. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus. Today we're going to speak the authority of Jesus. Come on. As a church, as a bride, we're going to sing. We're going to speak in strong tongues. We're going to proclaim blessing upon this land. Come on, why don't you join us? Jesus, you're welcome in this place. Jesus, we enthrone you.
Let's give Him praise. Our God is sovereign. Our God is in control. Our God is powerful God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, we want to pray for the nation. Just as much as maybe many of us are jubilant over whatever outcome that we have right today. We want to not take for granted. But we want to praise and thank the Lord and give thanks to Him. That He is in control of every situation for this nation. He has a great plan. The important thing is God has a plan and a purpose for Malaysia. Amen. And we are excited because it is a reset for greater things to come. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And God is going to do something beautiful to refresh, to refresh you and I. And we are going to, to take it just lightly and just another day, another project that is done. But it is right now the beginning of new things to come and we need to pray. We need to pray for the nation. The nation needs us even more right now. Let the church arise. You know, believe if God is control, then therefore the church must arise. The church must shine. The church must lead forth to make a change in this nation. Amen. Everyone, the one important thing that we can do is to pray. To pray for the nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our nation and the leaders. Pray for the nation. Hallelujah. Come. You know, just the ERM. The ERM. On that day when Pastor Lindy and uh, Pastor JJ was doing the act of repentance and says, the West of Malaysia wants to ask forgiveness from the East Malaysia. You know, when I saw that act, I was just telling the Lord, Lord, we have been doing this for many times. Many times. You know, when I was in Rana, I did it. And uh, when we were in uh, another place in Kuching, we did that also. And uh, Lord, how I wish, that was my wish then. I said, how I wish the East Malaysian leaders, our country leaders, will apologize. The West Malaysian leaders will apologize to the East Malaysian. And you know what? On Wednesday or Thursday, wow, when I saw that, I saw that apology by our leaders. I said, wow, God, you are doing something great for our nation. Wow, it's not just the church one say, but God, we are saying it's not just a physical act of uh, repentance or asking for forgiveness, but it is spiritual. The spiritual environment has changed. It's a shift. The whole Malaysian environment has shifted because of that very act. Yes, the people may say, wow, it's very brave of them, whoever leaders has apologized to the East Malaysian. But it is a spiritual act. You know, and the Lord reminded me about this verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 that all of us know, we quoted many times. And it says, In my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. You know, our leaders have humbled themselves. But the church, it's time for us to pray, right? They humble themselves. They may not know your God and my God, but we can pray for them because that very act is spiritual. And you know what? Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal our land. Hallelujah. That is so for Malaysia. Not only in the political arena, that is hope for Malaysia in the whole atmosphere and the spiritual place. Hallelujah. And the Lord says, continuing in verse 15, He says, Then I will hear your prayer. And I will be attentive to your prayer. Hallelujah. You know, how much more we need to pray because there's a breakthrough. There is a breakthrough now. Can you feel that? Can you see there's a breakthrough that God wants to hear your prayer and my prayer? Come on. Come on. Let's pray. Let's pray for the nation. Let's pray. Whatever in your hearts to bless the nation, to bless our leaders. Just pray. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you praise. Hallelujah. You love Malaysia, Lord. You love Malaysia, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. We know you love Malaysia. You have a great plan for Malaysia. And the Lord, your plan is going forward, God. And your church must rise up. Must rise up to know, understand the times of this time that you are moving. And I pray, Lord, that we will not slack. But Lord, we will look 
we will love able to see and understand your perspective and come alongside with you and says Lord I want to be in oh God what you're doing the church wants to be in what you're doing when you pray Lord Jesus oh God oh Lord for continuing oh Lord revival plan says oh Lord to the top of the leadership of this nation to the top leadership of the churches oh God even to the ground the people Lord oh God will see there's hope that is hope in the right in God. That's the hope of God in you, Lord. And we pray that as you change, oh God, the whole environment, the whole of God, system of this nation, oh God, for your glory. And we pray the most important thing, God, that the Lord, your spirit will pour into Malaysia. Your spirit will pour in and let your revival plans, oh God, move, move, oh God, into your, the hearts of your people because of God. You call us a God in 2 Chronicles 7 14. If my people who are called by my name, and Lord, we are called by your name, and we want to stand, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, together with you and say, Lord, we, you love Malaysia. We love Malaysia to God. You have a plans for Malaysia. We want the Lord to be part of your plans, oh God. We want to move with you. So Lord, bless the oh God Malaysia. Bless a lot of churches to arise, oh God. Bless our hearts to God. Even Lord, as we, oh God, move forward. Moving, oh Lord, move forward, oh Lord, to take frontiers, oh God, in the years to come, in the days to come. We know, Lord, you are here. You are with us. You are attentive to our prayer and you are leading us forward, hallelujah, to greater victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Hallelujah. And right now I pass today, our pastor Samkyung is going to deliver us the, the message. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Gilbert. Thank you very much, Pastor Gilbert. Praise the Lord. Yes, today is a day of celebration. I think we don't need a sermon today. All we need is a Thanksgiving service. <laughs> well, it depends on which side of the political divide you're on. But really, it's really wonderful to be here with all of you today. And uh, you all know, of course, Monday is a holiday. So yeah, do, don't forget uh, that it's a holiday. Don't go to work on Monday. All right. I just want to commit this time to the Lord. I just, want, I, I just feel that compelled. To, to give thanks to the Lord once again. Thank you so much, Pastor Gilbert, for praying for the nation. But I really want to just commit this time as well as to return thanks to the Lord. In victory, remember God. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to thank you once again, Lord God, that Lord, you establish your throne upon Malaysia, your throne of righteousness and justice, which is the foundation of your throne, Lord God, and you place it upon Malaysia, that we may once again have hope that rises in our hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that Father, not only that, you've given us peace, that you've given us a prosperity of the gospel, that, Lord God, that we have every chance to speak of your word in days to come. Lord God, our heart just brims over with love and thankfulness for your grace and mercy that's lavished upon Malaysia. We want to pray especially at this time for the new Prime Minister, for Datuk Sri Anwar, Father. Lord, we pray that you grant him the tenacity, the fortitude to lead this country in a way, Lord God, that's befitting of someone who stands for integrity, honesty, and righteousness, Lord. We pray to you, Father, and thank you for the wisdom given to our Duli Yamaha Mulia Agong, Father, for acting in the right moment at the right time in the right way, Father, Lord God. We praise your holy name, for Lord God, we know that in all this, your mighty right hand is on Malaysia. So, Father, even today as we share of your word, we pray, Lord God, that this word is not just a Logos word that's written in ink on paper, but Lord, it's a Rima word which proceeds from your throne room, Lord. We pray, Father, that your spirit will move powerfully, Lord God, today as we speak, that no lives will leave untouched. Father, we thank you. I, your servant, come before you. And Lord God, I pray that as we sit beneath the shadow of the cross, that nothing is added on nor taken away from your word this evening as it is preached, as we commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for the word. 
that He has given to us for today. We're going to do Judges, but before I go into Judges, uh, chapters 13 to 15, I'm just going to comment a little bit. I've been following the news. I'm sure all of you have been, right? Either you're on social media or you've just been watching the news that's been going on from the various newscasts. And for the whole past week, everybody has been waiting with bated breath as to the outcome of the GE15. And I'm sure that in the minds of many, people were thinking, is it going to be Abba or is it going to be Anwar? You know, which would it be? Would it, the, uh, Anwar be the, pre- the person who's going to lead Malaysia into the future? Well, now we know the results have been announced and we know that who's going to form it. But the future still remains to be seen. After so many years of hardship and waiting, Will Anwar Ibrahim, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, be the one that's going to lead Malaysia into the glorious future? Is he the man that's going to be the man of destiny, the man that God has appointed to lead Malaysia out of the miry clay into a solid rock? But this evening, we are not going to talk politics, okay? I know you will love to. Even if I spend the next two hours talking about it, everyone would want to listen to politics. But that, there has been a hot topic that's been, be, been debated over the last one week. It's overrated and overheated, okay? Everyone's talking about it from the Kopitiam to the Mama stall to the social media. It's everywhere. But today, I want to talk about you. I want to talk about you. What about you? Are you a man with a mission? or a person of purpose? Are you a man with a mission or a person with a purpose? We talk about Anwar Ibrahim being the man of the hour, the man of destiny that's going to lead Malaysia. But you will say, no, I'm just a small minnow in Ikan Bilis in this country. No, that's not true. Not everyone is destined for greatness, but everyone is prepped for a purpose. Let me repeat that. Not everyone is destined for greatness, but everyone is prepped for a purpose. Each one of us is placed in our own unique circumstances, with our own homes, our work environment and everything. No matter how great or small, how happy or sad you are at this moment, you are moving towards a defined purpose. You might not be Anwar at this moment in his life, at the height of the life of his, probably his life cycle, but you might be a water that watered in Baram in Sarawak. You know, Baram was a place where there was flooded and the waters came out. You might say, why? Why the water in Baram? What has that got to do with you? Well, perhaps maybe her one vote put the man of destiny into place to be the 10th Prime Minister of Malaysia. The power of one. Without her voting, together with the many others besides her, who voted in this nation, who have done so under dismal circumstances, Anwar may not be that man of destiny. The same applies for all of us too, but each of us in our own different situation. You could either choose to see it as a matter of fact, you know, daily life, life still goes on without any specific meaning or purpose, or you could pause and think and reflect for a while. Think of how many small ripples can group together to form a big wave. Think of how a hidden subterranean tremor can result in a huge tsunami. Likewise, many seemingly unrelated small events in each of our lives, when knitted together, when joined together, may have a far greater, far higher impact than we could imagine or our eyes could see. In other words, you can choose to realise that God in establishing His kingdom, there is no happenings that are aimless or meaningless. God is in control. Amen? We sang that just now. God is in control. And each of us knows that God has a defined and a divine purpose in accordance to it. Not only just for the nation, but for individuals like you and I who are seated here. You know, there was once I remember when we were here in the darkened hall, I think it was watch night or was it Easter? And each one of us were told to just light up that little light 
on our handphone. One light doesn't mean anything. But when all the lights were lit up, the whole hall was lit up. It was so beautiful, like the night sky with about a hundred, a thousand over lights that were lit up in the room. We are all like that. That God, when He puts us each in a defined purpose, when knitted together, God can see a tremendous outworking of the establishment of His kingdom on earth. And our each individual purpose blends in with the unfolding of God's sovereignty over you, your community, over the nation, and by extension, over the whole of the earth and God's creation. Amen? Now, how God unfolds His plans for you is through the manifested coming of His Holy Spirit in a powerful way. The coming of the Spirit is so essential, so powerful for achieving your divine purpose or destiny. The work of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's very important. It's important for us to realise our great need for the Holy Spirit's intervention and for us to submit to His prompting and to His power. Now, where do I get this from in the Bible? I think your mind will immediately think of Acts 2, right? The book of Acts. That's when the works and the signs and wonders of the Holy Spirit. Well, not for today, because we are obviously in the middle of the studies of the Judges series, right? And some of you will be a bit surprised on a slightly related note to hear that the Holy Spirit wasn't just present from Pentecost onwards. You probably heard from the, some fake news portal or from TikTok that the Holy Spirit only came down during Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection and not throughout the, old, the whole of the Old Testament. That's fake news. The Holy Spirit was there way, way, way before Pentecost. In fact, Genesis 1-2 says this, Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were there, even right at the beginning of creation. The Holy Spirit was present and active throughout the whole of the Old Testament, the New Testament, even up to today, and even beyond, a long way, way into perhaps even eternity. So for today, we are looking at the Holy Spirit's work. He's tremendous, He's powerful, his intensive work in the book of Judges in chapters 13 to 15. And chapters 13 to 15, together with 16, the four chapters, they make up the most chapters in the whole book of Judges. 21 chapters of it all together. Four out of 21 chapters were all devoted to the exploits of just one judge. Wow, this judge must be pretty important, right? Just almost as important as Datuk Sri Anwar, you know? He's as famous as him. Well, who do you think he is? Samson. Samson. All of you have heard of Samson. How many of you have never heard of Samson before? Right? All of you have heard of Samson. Perhaps maybe you heard of Samson because of the other person in his life. Ah, I see smiles on the face. Delilah, right? You always associate Samson with Delilah. That's the story we're all here, right? Delilah. Nothing beats injecting a little bit of romance into the plot to make the story interesting. Amen? <laughs> but perhaps later, you will begin to understand as we go through these chapters, especially in chapter 16, that behind the success of every man is a woman. But behind the failure of every man is another woman. <laughs> Samson perhaps has more than one woman. But you will also see, as we look, go through these chapters 13 to 15, the greater the purpose and the destiny in an individual, the more powerfully the Holy Spirit moves in that person. You also find that the Spirit of God worked in Samson despite all his glaring shortcomings. You know, he has this eye, a wandering eye for women and a weakness and giving in to anger and vengeance and even taking bets and crazy risks and so on and other shortcomings. Like those of his many fellow judges throughout the whole book of Judges. Like those of yours and mine too who amongst us never had a wandering eye or never took crazy risk or maybe even never given in to anger. No hands risen, right? Nobody here is blameless before we knew Christ or sinless even right now. Of course, Samson never had the privilege of having Jesus Christ, of knowing him personally, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in his life. But 
God still worked out his purpose in Samson because he's a man of destiny. God indeed has a purpose specifically for him. And each time, God does so by the giving of his Holy Spirit in those instances in a very powerful way in those crucial moments. So would you want to see how God can work out even your own divine purpose or destiny through the powerful infilling of the Holy Spirit? Right? Let's look at Judges 13 to 15. These three, judges, these three chapters of Judges have so many biblical truths in it that if I were to go into detail verse by verse, it would take three days and three nights to finish. All right? And you'd be I'm camp here for three days and three nights. But, but, I'm not going to do so. I only got a short, maybe about 25 minutes left. And in these 25 minutes, I'm going to exegete from the book of Judges. I'm going to take little excerpts here and there. And I'm going to do so, so that we can go back and have your dinner before your stomach start to growl. So, we're going to see the gist of the Lord's dealing with Samson, starting from chapter 13, where Samson began his life. And then in chapters 14 and 15, it's the Lord's dealing with Samson through the working, the inner working of the Holy Spirit in his life. Chapter 13, verse 1 starts with, Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. The scene is set for Samson's beginning, when Israel fell into sin once again. That's the seventh cycle amongst all the judges. They fell into sin, they disobeyed God, they were put into oppression, God raised the champion, brought them out again, delivered them, and then they forgot about God, they fell into sin. So there were cycles and cycles of this going on. And after so many oppression, and the last one by the Philistines for 40 years, in the midst of all this, under Philistine rule, Samson was born. But not before a couple of angelic visits to Samson's mom and dad, Manoah and his wife. It was God's preparation for Samson's birth and upbringing. Let me read to you further down in chapter 13 from verse 2 onwards to 5. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you're going to get pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and you do not eat anything unclean. Rings a bell somewhere, right? Where have you heard this before? It sounds very similar to Abraham and Sarah, isn't it? When the angel appeared to them and then when, angel, when the angel explained to Abraham, Sarah laughed and then later she got pregnant. Good thing here Manoah didn't laugh or else he'd be the one that got pregnant. But it goes on in verse 5, speaking to Manoah's wife, you will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. Dedicated to God from the womb, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now when God prepares an individual to grow and flow into his sovereign plans, which is for the deliverance of the oppressed Israelites, he cuts no corners. He makes sure everything happens in accordance to his sovereign design, in the execution of his divine purpose for Samson in this case. You know what God does? He does three things in preparation for Samson's birth. First, he garners the buy-in of the parents into his project Samson by granting them a sign, a sign of supernatural healing or bringing fertility out of barrenness. Now, even the response from the parents then, when God sent his angels to appear to them, wasn't a straightforward, yes, I hear, I obey. It wasn't that at all. In fact, there was a lot of toing and froing, humming and wondering, you know, skepticism, a lot of questions being asked by the husband. Is it really the Lord doing an amazing work in Manoah's wife? That response would not be very different from our response to even when we encounter and a, and a sign, an appearance of God in our lives. There are times where they were doubt initially. And we wonder, what is it that's happening in our lives? But God sent His angel for a second visit further down in Judges chapter 3, verses 9 to 23, in response to Manoah's prayer. Manoah was smart enough. He actually prayed to the Lord, and this was his prayer. Pardon your servant, Lord, 
I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring the boy who is to be bring up the boy who is to be born. Wow, that's a very heartfelt prayer of a parent to be. It's a godly and appropriate prayer made in faith even before the boy was born. How wonderful it is if all of us were to, to pray that prayer even in a, some of us young parents with, with carrying a pregnancy and to pray that before the baby is even born or when the baby, the child is born, constantly to seek the Lord with this sort of prayer. Lord, teach us how to bring the boy up. I, I, I remember that, that there's this family, a family of five that worships at workplace at the river. They, 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 they take this phrase, this verse from, from the Proverbs, Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 and made that their family, their family motto. The trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Submit all the ways to Him and then He will direct your paths. And the children were brought up along in those ways and they were brought up well. You know, when, when, when we ask the Lord, I mean, we pray to the Lord in such a way as Manoah did, I'm sure the Lord's heart will be moved by your prayer and He'll be delighted to answer that prayer. I'm speaking to some of us here who may be very young parents, who may be just in the beginning of a pregnancy, or maybe some of you here may be praying for a pregnancy but have been not been successful for some time. Take a leaf from Manoah, from Manoah's book, that how he prayed and he sought the Lord. And I'm sure the Lord will be delighted to answer your prayer in his time. Amen? Then secondly, the angel of the Lord outlined how Samson should be brought up as a Nazarite. What's a Nazarite? A Nazarite is someone who is consecrated, set apart for the Lord's purpose or the Lord's service. And in, in the Old Testament times, it would require them to follow certain spiritual disciplines very strictly, which includes keeping away from the razor, no cutting of hair, no, no shaving, and also keep away from alcoholic drinks. And if you were to see a Nazarite, perhaps even today, if you see a Nazarite walking in the street, you would be sure to identify him. He would look like someone like perhaps Chewbacca, you know, Chewie in the Star Wars fame, something like him who could walk in a straight line, you know. But seriously, the secret is really not in the hair. See, I went for a haircut just to prove a point, right? <laughs> the secret is in the ability and the willingness of the person to keep to the spiritual discipline, to keep to the spiritual discipline. It's like what Pastor Chu said in the last prayer altar on Tuesday. We were, we were supposed to have a leaders meeting, but it, it was prompted by the Holy Spirit to turn it into a prayer altar. And in the prayer altar, people were praying loudly. But Pastor Chu said this, it is not in the decibel of your voice, that God hears. It's in the decibel of your spirit. It's the spirit of the matter. How you respond, how you yield to the Holy Spirit, not in the outward prayer that matters most to the Lord God Almighty. Then thirdly, the angel also affirmed the parents that Samson, like each one of us, has a divine purpose. In verse 5, the angel says, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. I started by sharing how God will lead us into our divine purpose, no matter where our standing in life is. As we go into Judges 14 and 15, I would also like us to look into the three areas. There are three areas in our lives where God can send His Spirit to work powerfully so that we can flow into our life's destiny or purpose. As Samson was similarly led towards his God-ordained purpose. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully as Samson met with strong challenges and he encountered God's provision, protection. Secondly, when Samson met with losses, he encountered God's provision. And thirdly, when Samson met with certain failure, in fact, facing doom, he met with God's promotion. In this case, it's not advertising, huh? it's God promoting him, Right? God's, let's say after me, God's protection, God's provision, and God's promotion. Let's look at the first one. Samson encountering God's protection. 
and we met with challenges. How many of you think that Samson is a muscle-bound weightlifter, such a guy, you know, who strut around like a peacock, you know, and when girls see, they will swoon and faint? How many have that image of Samson? Right? Quite a number of us, right? We would thought that Samson is that guy, tough guy, you know. Well, I was brought up with uh, this diet of old movies, Steve McQueen, you know. All, all this, they, they portray all these biblical characters. If you look closely in the book of Judges, chapters 13 to 15, Samson is actually a teenager who is just going into adulthood. He's probably about 18, 19 or 20 years old at the beginning of chapter 14 and going into chapter 15. He's just a gangly teenager, perhaps maybe a little bit buff, nevertheless a teenager. So with due respect to Mr. Samson, I put it to you that he may have the hardware but lack the software. He may have a strong exterior, but he might be a bit muddled and messed up inside. In fact, he would, probably would have passed off as any of our teenagers who are here in shorts and wearing an oversized T-shirt. But see what he did from Judges chapter 14, verses 1 to 2, and then 8 to 10. Let me read to you. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Now, he was, if he was a mature adult, he was full grown, he would have courted the woman herself and asked for a hand in marriage and not asked the parents to go and get her for him. Then in verse 8, sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the, women's, uh, the lion's carcass and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped up the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now his father went down to see the woman, and there Samson held a feast, as was customary for young men. Samson seems intent in indulging in his own personal desires, in complete disregard of his calling as a Nazarite. He practically, literally, slept with the enemy. He made friends with the Philistines. At those times, the Philistines and the Jews were enemies. And he decided on a mixed marriage with a Gentile Philistine woman. On top of that, as a Nazarite, he's not supposed to touch dead bodies. Even the lion's carcass was abhorrent to a man of God, the Nazarite. And yet he defiled himself by taking the honey from the lion's carcass. And didn't tell his parents, gave to the parents too. His parents would be horrified if they knew where it came from. And presumably to do, he took wine at his wedding feast, which is customary during those times. But as I read this passage, strangely enough, all these challenges were strikingly similar to the challenges I had when I was raising my four children. When they were growing out of their teenage years. Frankly, I don't remember any of them being consecrated to be Nazarites or fighting lions, but I'm sure some of you parents were here can identify with me, right? We had teenager children who had some of these problems. Of course, not with the lions and the Nazarite thing, but they would have these problems there. Or perhaps maybe you might be a teenager yourself or a young adult who will be having these struggles or challenges in your life as you go through this. Well, I've got good news for you. Our God is as gracious now and as compassionate now as He was then. And He knows the angst that we all go through, whether you are a young person or as a parent. See what Judges 14 verse 4 says. His parent did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. This was from the Lord, the parent would have thought. What are you saying you know, as if you were a parent, and if I were to tell you this is happening because it is from the Lord, you were saying, are you crazy, pastor? There's a lot throwing Philistines at me just to make my life interesting. You think I don't have enough stress or what? No, that's not what it is about. What exactly is about is that what I started off earlier by saying that the Lord will work things out. The Lord does work things out when we realise our divine calling or purpose. God is in absolute control. He works all things out for good with those who love Him who are called according to His purpose. 
Romans 8, 28. He does that. And this is exactly what the Lord is working out in Samson's life. For Samson, the Lord in his mercy did not hold all his violations against him. Instead, there was the most obvious manifestation of the Lord's inpouring of the Holy Spirit to protect Samson when the push comes to a shove. The protective care of the Lord was most evident when a real crisis happened. Look in verses 5 to 6. Samson went out to Tinnah together with his father and mother. And as they approached the vineyards of Tinnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him as he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father or mother what he had done. It wasn't a formula that Samson could repeat all the time. And remember, he's still a young man coming out of his teenage years. How could he have fought off the lion, let alone kill it on his own, if not for the Lord's intervention through His Holy Spirit coming upon Samson powerfully? God diverted away the risk of a potentially dangerous situation, a life-threatening situation, an impossible situation with the infilling of the Holy Spirit at that crucial moment. And all that was required was just faith that God had a divine purpose that will work things out. Whether the lion or no lion, God will work things out. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 says this, God's grace being made sufficient for you, for His power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, you can boast, or may I paraphrase, can embrace all the more gladly your weaknesses so that Christ's power, not our power, but Christ's power may rest on you. You just have to trust on the Lord's protection and ask for an increased anointing of His Holy Spirit. Amen? The other bit of the good news is that the Lord Himself has wonderfully brought all of my children especially my son who was a teenager at the time, out of his struggles and in his rebelliousness, and each one of them at one time or another was riding on their parents' faith, our faith as parents. And as parents, we prayed and we wrestled with them through that season in their life until they met their own young lion. They had this encounter with a strong challenge, and it was in those moments that the Holy Spirit worked in their lives and brought them out, and they found their own faith, and they found their own journey, their own purpose, their own destination in life. And today, today I can testify that each one of them are walking with the Lord, and they're even serving as leaders because of the the Lord's intervention in their life. And this is the anointing of the Lord's Spirit upon their life when you discover your prophetic destiny, your divine destiny in each of your own lives. Amen? Just invite the Holy Spirit in regularly, even either as a parent or even as a young person. Call on to the Lord and believe you me, the Holy Spirit just comes down powerfully, powerfully when you ask the Lord in prayer. Let Him take control, especially in situations when you know there is absolutely no control. I remember that there was this instance before my son was about to go overseas and I know that though I had him in the house for about 20 years, but the moment he leaves the house, I have absolutely no control over him. And I remember praying to the Lord, that Lord, you take over. For as much as I'm the father to my son, I'm only a steward for him and you take over the Lord. Take over Lord. And the Lord has done an amazing thing and done an amazing thing. Hallelujah. Then, there's this encounter of Samson with God's provision. At times when Samson met with losses. Where was that? In chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, Samson made a bet with the Philistines' wedding party using a riddle, thinking that he would surely win. Verse 12 says this, Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. And if you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Now, these linen garments were the tuxedos of those days, all right? They were expensive. They were specially woven. 
So they were actually worn for special occasions and it would have cost a hefty sum. So they, re they replied to Samson, tell us the riddle, they said. Let's hear it, he replied. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they could not give the answer. Good thing those days they didn't have Dunkin' Donuts or Baskin Robbins, right? <laughs> for I would have thought that this would be ice cream or something sweet. But no, it wasn't that. He was talking about the lion. So what did they do? The 30 odd is Philistines got Samson's wife, the brand new bride, to cry throughout the seven days of the wedding feast in order to coax the answer out of Samson. Imagine that. A new bride crying day and night and wailing and wailing and wailing. And you are the bridegroom? You know, any Chinese bridegroom who hears the bride crying for seven days and night will say, choi, 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 go you know, go away. But not Samson. Anybody else would have given in. And Samson gave in. And Samson gave in. He relented and gave the bride the answer. But he paid the price for being foolish and arrogant. For now, he owed the 30 pieces of linen and the clothes. But again, the Lord was patient with Samson as he had other plans for the Philistines. In verse 19, what happened was the Spirit of the Lord, the second time now, came powerfully upon Samson. And he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 of the men, stripped them of everything and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. Wow. It was quite a mean thing to do. Although Samson was prohibited from doing what he did, God in his mercy and having a sovereign plan for the deliverance of Israel provided for Samson's loss. Now you must think in a context of a person, let's say you are a father and you have a child that's in his teenage years, if he, if he were to commit a crime, let's say to set cars on fire or, or, or to, to, to exit a manslaughter or something, the punishment that's befitting a teenager is different from the punishment as, let's say, a 40 or 50-year-old man who did exactly the same thing. And this is exactly the scenario. I'm not saying that Samson did the right thing, but in his youthful enthusiasm and his anger, which he can't control, and his shortcomings, he did what he did. But God had a divine purpose over that. It was God's provision, despite of man's prohibition. God's provision, despite of man's prohibition. I mentioned this before, and I gave a short account of this testimony last week, or no, three weeks ago, when, when I was preaching. But I think many of you have not heard it before. It was after the second service when I preached that this man came to me. He's a brother in the church. He comes usually for the third service. And he was telling me about this incident, relating it. He's an SIBKL businessman who was in despair. And he owned a big factory. And he, he has sort of built up his business for quite some time and was earning some income until COVID hit. And when COVID hit, he was also slapped with a court case that lasted for a long time. So he was actually at the brink of bankruptcy it was about to sell this factory and to give up and wound up this business and try something new. But thank God, he had two Christian lawyers who was helping him with this court case of his. And they would meet regularly. Every time they meet, they would pray. The lawyers initiated it. And then when they pray, they sense from the Lord that this business that this SIBKL businessman had would be something that the Lord wanted to raise up as a testimony in the workplace. And they encourage him to carry on the business. Don't sell the factory. With whatever little savings you have, keep it. And when I started praying, within three weeks, just three weeks, he was owing 3.7 million in debts. On top of that, there's a court case. But within three weeks, he got three projects that total up to 13 million. And the buyers and the, the people for the project paid him the 5 million down payment just to settle the debts. Praise the Lord! That was amazing. That was amazing. And God couldn't have been more precise in His provision. Today, this brother's factory is back in business and is just so excited in one thing. And when I ask His permission, He said, go, tell others, this is what the Lord has done. When He is in the midst of severe losses, God provides. Amen? God provides. Now, I'm not preaching the prosperity gospel here. I'm not saying that every time you got no money, go to the Lord, you ask for Mercedes, God will give you one. No, not at all. But I'm saying that when you are in need, genuine need, you come before the Lord, the Lord never shortchanges anyone who seeks Him. Amen? 
There may be some of us here who are seeking challenges at the workplace or even losing jobs or at work. Let me encourage you. For God, nothing, nothing is too difficult for Him. You will just surrender it to Him and gather a few around you to seek the Lord, genuinely seek the Lord, pray to Him. Maybe perhaps establish a regular workplace altar like this person did, this brother did, and have a regular workplace altar. We have got four arms of ministry in SIBKL for the workplace community here, not just one ministry. We have got the workplace ministry under Brother Chan Soon, and then we have also have accomplished, which is not exactly under SIBKL, but it's an initiative for SIBKL under Marcel, Adrian, and Eileen. And then we also have Alpha, the workplace, which is an outreach arm under Claudia, and also our very own church plant, Workplace at the River. And that's under Pastor Joel and myself. Now, we are all here and ready to journey with you if there are challenges and we would love to be of service to you. Amen? Do come and we will journey with you together at the workplace where God will establish a testimony. You're going to be a beacon of light. You're going to be the salt of the earth when you testify for God and see God working not only on a Sunday, but every day of the week in your life. Amen? Thirdly, Samson encountered God's promotion, elevating him beyond his circumstances. When he met with certain failure, he was meeting certain death when he encountered God's promotion. The story of Samson continued in chapter 5 with a return visit to his Philistines in laws in Timnah. And he found that she was given to somebody else. So in a fit of anger, he took revenge on the Philistine community, not on the family, but on the rest of the community by playing a prank on them. It's something which a young man would do, a teenager would do. He got the foxes, set the tails on fire and set them loose, you see. So they ran around and burned everything. So the wind yards, the wheat, the, the grass, the, the, the agricultural plants, everything was burned down. So that incensed all the Philistines. In return, they wanted to look for Samson. And, and as a result of that, there was a, quite a bit of unrest and there was a mini civil war that Samson started. So what happened? Samson slaughtered quite a number of the Philistines and then he became a fugitive. And as he ran away, he hid in a cave at the rock of Etam. And, and as he hid there, the Judahites came, about 3,000 Judah, 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 well, from the tribe of Judah, the Judahites. Now, they are Jews. They are actually friendly. But they were forced to capture Samson and hand him over to the Philistines because they were under the rule of the Philistines. So they had no choice but to do that. So they were caught, uh, sorry, Samson was caught and he was bound, not just with raffia strings, but with thick cords, and it was about to be handed over to the Philistines. Then an amazing thing happened as they approached the Philistine camp. Chapter 15, verses 14 and 15. As they approached Lehi, the Philistines came towards him shouting. They were baying for blood, crying, give us Samson. Again for the third time, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flags and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and he struck down a thousand men. Wow! Not the Incredible Hulk, not a Marvel hero, but just a young man, a Jewish young man. When the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, he took just uh, not even any weapon, not even a sword, the jawbone of a donkey, and he struck down a thousand men. Out of what seemed like an impossible situation, certain doom for Samson came salvation for him. And the beginning, the beginning of deliverance for the Israelites through the coming, the indwelling, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. It was turned around of a crisis into an opportunity. Our God of turnarounds gives Samson yet another chance to step into his divine calling. And up to then, he was still like a gangly teenager playing pranks and all that. But that was the first time that he acted bravely and powerfully in a mighty way. And it was recorded in the scripture. It was the beginning of the deliverance of the Israelites. When once Samson only cared about himself, indulged in his own longings, his lustful desires, now he began to realize 
that he's a defender of his people. God promoted him to be the defender of his people. God's divine plan and purpose for Samson began to be realized. God's divine plan and purpose for each one of us is to promote and to elevate us, not for our own glory, but for our transformation into Christ's glory. Our transformation into Christ's glory. Can someone say an amen to that? That is what God does. Whether we realize it or not, step by step, God brings us transformed daily from glory to glory into the image of Christ. Just now, Pastor Gilbert, when he was praying for the nation, shared about what happened last Tuesday. But what happened last Tuesday is a culmination of many, many months and years of prayers it has started even before GE 14, that the churches, Malaysian churches, were more united in prayer this season for the last few years, more than any other time in the history of the establishment of God's kingdom in Malaysia. And as we were united in prayer, people from all walks of life, every denomination came together to pray. We were praying for a good outcome, not praying for the good outcome of any political party, but just praying that God's righteousness and justice be established upon Malaysia. And that will be peace and unity among the different races. And then came the GE 15. And we were in the middle of it where there was a hung parliament and everyone was so worried what would be the outcome. And we were really, Malaysia was really at the crossroad. It's either we would really spiral down because there were certain ethnocentric and religious-centric parties that if they come into power would lead Malaysia one path or there will be a unity and peace among all the races in Malaysia. What would it be? Then came the prophetic act, the prophetic act that happened last Tuesday. It wasn't just the act, but it was indeed a prophetic act by Pastor Lindy and Pastor JJ on one side where the Chinese sought for forgiveness from our East Malaysian Bumiputra brother. That prophetic act was enacted by the political leaders in real life after that prayer. Praise the Lord for that. Hallelujah. It is not of our doing. We could never have none. We, we, we never knew that was going to happen. But the Lord brought it about. And it's an amazing thing. It's the powerful moving of the Holy Spirit across the land when we thought it was an impossible situation right ahead of us. The leaders that were there that gathered to pray that night, I want to thank God for each one of them because the leaders in SIBKL were resolute. They were keeping their eyes on the Lord, that their eyes are upon God all the time for the battle belongs to Him and the victory belongs to the Lord. Amen? And they had great faith for our beloved nation because every prayer, every prayer that was raised to the Lord in the whole of Malaysia has soaked the whole land that through the one mediator and one God between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for many. And we call upon his name over the land. Hallelujah. But at a crucial point, just three days ago, the whole nation were biting the news that at that crossroad, we were there. And that was exactly when the prophetic act was enacted. And that helped into the melting of the rivalries between the various political parties. And on top of that, that was only part of it. With that was a timely royal decree for an inclusive unity govern, government by our DYMM Agong. And he was endowed definitely with divine wisdom together with his brother rulers. So that the crisis of having a singularly ethnocentric, religiocentric government in Malaysia was averted. Instead, we have an inclusive unity government, which today we can give glory and thanksgiving to God for. Let's give Him praise for that. Amen? Let's give God praise for that. For through the Spirit of the Lord's timely and powerful intervention, Malaysia is beginning to be elevated out of the miry clay and put on a solid rock, a solid foundation. That foundation is the foundation of God upon which justice and righteousness sits His throne. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 
God in His sovereignty deals with the prophetic destiny of the individual first to align it with the nation's destiny, like Samson and Israel's. Often, it necessitates the Holy Spirit to move in increasingly more powerful and more powerful and spectacular ways. So for it to be realised, you will need to yearn and thirst for God in humility. See what Samson did in chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Samson recognised himself as a servant of God for the very first time after his victory over the Philistines. And he said this, because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, Lord, you have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. That was the moment that Samson realised his prophetic destiny. He knew that he was a servant of God, that he could not do things his own way. He flowed into his prophetic destiny. May I encourage you to develop a regular habit of crying out to the Lord. And the best place to do it is at an altar, whether be it a personal, a family or corporate altar. Cry out to the Lord like Samson did so that you will realise your prophetic destiny and God will align it to flow into that of a national destiny for Malaysia. In victory, always remember God. Our sovereign God always prepares each one for a purpose. And we begun this evening with learning from Samson how he was led into his higher purpose or destiny. Can I have the worship team up, please? And then we saw also how God provided a divine protection, a divine provision, and a divine promotion along each step of the way for Samson by the powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We too need to adopt, need to adopt the humility and the thirsting for the Spirit of the Lord to work powerfully in our lives, like Samson finally realised at the end of chapter 15. And that's when he rose to be a judge over Israel for the next 20 years. And then after that comes chapter 16, an exciting episode with Delilah. And you want to hear that? Come back next week. All right? That's in chapter 16. So in closing, I want to encourage you that many of us have been thirsting and hungering and longing for the fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit for some time. And at the close of this service, I want to invite you to come forward. Just come forward and let the Holy Spirit, not us, not the pastor, not the leader, but it's the Holy Spirit that's going to come. A fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life as you flow into your prophetic destiny. We are all in the Lord's sanctuary. Let this be a holy ground for you. God is here. There's no need for theatrics or drama. And all you need to do is put yourself humbly before God and with upraised hands, pleading, thirsting, asking for the Lord that I'm ready to receive, Lord. I've known you, I know your Holy Spirit is in me, but I need a fresh anointing, a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit. So I would invite you, if you are really that person, to come forward afterwards. As we sing the closing song, the altar is open. And all you have to do is just come forward and say, Come, Holy Spirit. Nothing else. Just wait for the Holy Spirit in filling upon yourself. It may be that you've been walking or serving the Lord for a long time and you're feeling a little dry. Or perhaps you're a brand new Christian, just newly minted, and you want to have that exciting infilling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Or perhaps maybe that's the gift of tongues you know and you've seen so many of your friends who are Christians who have gone on with the Lord when the Holy Spirit filled them 
with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you want that and you want the gift of tongues too so they can move on with the Lord or perhaps you have missed the touch from the Lord Jesus that, that, that first love that, that warm feeling of the Lord upon your heart when you first knew Him that number of years ago and you want to say Lord I want that touch once again today I want it Lord I want it Lord come come to the front and just receive from the Holy Spirit but for some of you it could be a feeling of a loss perhaps a loss of health that some disease in one way or another has robbed you of health or maybe a loss of money or job or perhaps even God forbid it a loved one and has resulted in an achy feeling in your heart that's been there for some time and you feel that I need there's a hole in my heart that's been there Lord I need something to fill it ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill it today come forward we just want you Holy Spirit not the pastor not anybody else there won't be anyone that will be coming forward to pray or whisper anything in the ear. But you just come forward and stand before the Lord Himself and just tell the Lord, Come, Holy Spirit. Let's all stand. Before we sing the closing song, there may be just some of you who may not even know the Lord Jesus personally and you have come into this church this holy sanctuary for the very first time or the first few times and each time you came in there's that little tugging in your heart and you know that there's something in there there's this vacuum this empty space and the tug is because of that now provided you're certain it's not a heart attack coming on I want you to respond to that tug because it's the Holy Spirit knocking at the door of your heart and saying this is a day that you ought to respond to it and you have not met the Lord Jesus before and you are in this hall, may I invite you to just come forward and just stand and someone, someone will come to you. The altar is now open as we sing the closing song. This beautiful song as we worship the Lord again, God is on the throne. And he comes down on you even as you call upon him. Oh, if you desire to have this touch of the Holy Spirit, the altar is open. Just come forward and say, Come, Holy Spirit, and the Spirit will touch you. He will work in your life for the loss, for the feeling, that vacuum that's been in your heart. It is a time that the Spirit will minister to you. Not us, not human beings, not for my sake, not for anybody's sake. But the Lord wants to touch you once again, to refresh you, to bring you into your prophetic destiny, the purpose for which the Lord has called you to. That in Jesus' name, you will be that new creation. That you will be that person that the Lord ministers to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God is on the throne. Hallelujah. Yes, God is on the throne In control Yes, Lord, you're in control, Lord God 
Yes, Lord God, there is none like you, Lord God, that you hold the destiny, not only of individuals, but of nations in your hands, Lord God. You are powerful, powerful, oh Lord God. Hallelujah. Oh Lord God Almighty, look upon your people, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. May your spirit sweep over this room, Lord God. May it go from here into the nation, come out from the sanctuary into those that seek you, Lord God. Yes, Lord God. Who is like you? Who is there like you in the whole of the universe? Who can compare to you, Lord God? And Lord God, that you reign not only on your throne on high, but you reign upon the throne of each and every heart that's devoted to you here, Lord God, that knows you as the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are one God and there is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you speak into our lives transforming us day by day into the glory of your image, Lord. And I pray this over each and every one of my dear brother and sister, that even as we depart from this place today, Lord, that we go forth carrying the fragrance and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, that wherever we go, the rose of Sharon, the fragrance of the Lord, spreads throughout the land. And even the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ brings the light and brings each one to be the salt to season the land wherever they go, Lord. And I pray this over their lives that for each family, each person, each individual that's represented here today as they go forth, Lord God, may the fragrance and the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ go with one and all. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Hallelujah. Have a good weekend. Enjoy Monday off. And to join us again next Saturday. There will be a prayer altar on Tuesday. But do join us again. Or you would like to bring your friends for our service tomorrow at 8.30 or 11 a.m. Thank you. God bless. If you would like someone to pray for you, head over to the is to be a generous church. It is now so much easier for you to give. All you need to do is to scan this QR code and it will lead you to our giving page. You can give via online banking transfer or do it now transfer. You can also drop your Titan offerings in the box just outside the sanctuary. It is because of your generous giving that we can be a blessing to others. If you're new to our church, do fill up your welcome card so that you can redeem your free gift. If you've parked in Bangunan Yin, don't forget to validate your Touch and Go card. Hi everyone! Would you like to get to know SIBKL a little bit more? If you've ever had such questions like, how can I join a cell group? How can I serve in a ministry? How can I be discipled? How can I be a member? How can I join one of our SIBKL events? Or any other questions? then I invite you to click on the link below and we will connect with each other via WhatsApp. One of our Connect leaders will reach out to you. We would love to connect with you, so we invite you to connect with us. God bless.
If you're new to our church, do fill up your welcome card so that you can redeem your free gift. If you've parked in Bangunan Yin, don't forget to validate your Touch and Go card. One of the DNAs of SIBKL is to be a generous church. It is now so much easier for you to give. You can give via online banking transfer or do it now transfer. All you need to do is to scan this QR code and it will lead you to our giving page. You can also drop your tithe and offerings in the box just outside the sanctuary. It is because of your generosity.